Okay. Would you please tell us your name and where you were born and your birth date? My name is Paula Kornblum Papaski. I was born in Kalashin, Poland in January 29, 1923. And tell us what life was like in Kalashin. It was a small city, 36 miles east of Warsaw. And when I was growing up, it was predominantly a Jewish city. 80% people were Jewish there. And uh, the first thing what I remember is going to kindergarten. We had a Hebrew kindergarten. And then uh, public school. I went to public school. And uh, we had a pretty good life because it so happens that my parents were well off. We had a family business, which was a flour mill. My grandfather built it, and some of the children were involved in that business. And uh, went to school there, finished school. Tell me about school. What, what was school like? I went to a Polish school. And, um, but we had to separate the, the Jewish children from the Gentile children because there was no separation of state and religion. In other words, religion was taught in school too. And the, the, the Jewish people didn't want them to teach Catholic religion in, in, for the, to the Jewish children. And neither did the Catholic children wanted the Jewish religion. So what they did is they made the school number one and school number two. So they separated the children. But the curriculum was the same. And a matter of fact, most of the teachers what taught me were Gentile teachers. And school was very hard in, in, in Europe. We started, for instance, geography and history in the third grade. I enjoyed school very much. And then, but there was no secondary school. For secondary school, you had to go to Warsaw which I didn't go, but my sister did, and my brother did. But I think that uh, after we went through the seventh grade, we were pretty much informed in, the, in, the, in that school. And it didn't, after I finished school, most of the girls, you know, I, I for instance, I had a hobby of uh, needlepoint and sewing. And that's, and most of the, of the women didn't work, which I mean didn't work, they worked, but they were mostly housewives. I, see. I know now business, what I can mostly refer to in my family is most the men took care of the business and the women took care of the, of the household. I see. Tell me what, what your family's life was like. Was there a synagogue that you went to? Were there many synagogues in Kalushin? They, there was a synagogue, and there were also a lot of the Hasidic places of worship. Now, I come from a very orthodox family, very orthodox. And uh, it's... For instance, when it came Saturday or a Jewish holiday, everything closed up. We enjoyed it very much. And uh, there was synagogue. It was a synagogue. It was smaller synagogues. And even the non-observant didn't have a choice and had to observe it because there was no, the stores were closed. All the businesses shut up. And, uh, but also by the same token, we had a lot of secular organizations, like the Zionist organizations, which were not so religious, and also left-wing organizations. In other words, what, what I see looking back on that time, when I was a teenager, it was a vibrant city. Tell me about your family, your family life. Your mother was at home, and there, how many children were there? We in had your three family? children in our home. Three children. Three children. My sister, a younger sister, older brother. My brother would have been now seventy-two years old. 
He was born in 1920, in June 1920. And uh, and you had uncles and cousins and aunts? I and had that. My, like I said, we had, my grandmother lived downstairs. We lived upstairs. My aunt lived in the other part of the house. And then across the street, we had an uncle and, uh, and uh, aunt and cousins. And overall, I had, in the neighborhood, 13 cousins. Had your family lived in collusion for several generations? I think what I know, that my grandfather was born there, and he was born in, 96, in 1867. And uh, my grandmother was, was not from Kalashin. Now, my father was from Warsaw. He had his parents in Warsaw and his brothers and sisters in Warsaw. After he married my mother, he, at first she stayed in Warsaw, and then he came to Kalashin and got involved in the mill business. I see. Do you have any recollections from when you were a little girl of feeling different because you were Jewish or, or any, any of the Gentile children or Gentile adults making an issue of it? We had some snares from the, you know, and, and, and some, uh, what, what happened over there was that we, even we intermingled with a lot of Gentiles, and we had a lot of Gentile neighbors, next door neighbors. But we went our separate ways in socializing. Mm -hmm. we, ne we did very little socializing. So even as, as a child, there uh, was, you, all your friends were Jewish? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Every, uh, Jewish, you didn't see any, um, very little. And even if it would have been socializing, it would probably be in hiding. Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't socially accepted, acceptable. Accepted. So when you were 10 years old, that was 1930. Three. OK, 1933, 34, were things starting to change at that point? or? At that time, when Hitler came to power, this I remember, I still was going to school at that time. When Hitler came to power, and Gentile children used to sometimes throw rocks at us and say, wait, wait till Hitler's going to come for you. Or Jews go to Palestine. It's no place for you. Did your family consider leaving? We didn't consider leaving because our livelihood was there. And uh, we were so rooted there. Did anybody in your family leave? I mean, was my there... aunt left. Your aunt left. My aunt left, not for the reason, for the reason because she fell in love with a with a man, and he went there. And after he he got lived there for about two years, he came back to Poland and married her, and she left in 1936. But then she came to visit in 1938, and she left about half a year before the war broke out. Okay. So things got very difficult. How soon after Hitler came to power? How did they also, change? Also, what it was difficult, what was difficult is also that even the government, the Polish government, had was anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Because I remember that they went, there was once a pogrom, mm -hmm. and uh, and not too far from us, and and then it was another pogrom in south of Poland, and they killed a couple of Jews, and the Jews were afraid. The prime minister came out with a saying, roughly translated, he said, "Don't be the Jews, but you can boycott their business." And this was in the 30s? In the 30s, I think about 37, 38. So tell me how things started to change. You're a schoolgirl, and for example, did your school shut down, or did you have to wear identification that you were not, Jewish? Not, not, not when, when uh, before the war. Okay. Before the war, that was, it's supposed to have been a democratic country. So all the way through the 30s, this, everything all, was normal. It was normal business. You know, sometimes it was better, sometimes it was worse. But we were pretty much secure in our livelihood. Mm -hmm. Was but there a lot of news from Germany? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, so, had, a, we, we, were, we had a couple of newspapers coming every day. But was there a sense in the, in the community in Kalashin that things were changing or that bad things were happening? 
we, we saw that happening to German Jews. Mm -hmm. And then in 1938, Germany started, they were a, a couple thousand, I don't know exactly how many, Polish Jews who lived in Germany and never became citizens. And one day, the Germans put them all together, brought them to the Polish border, and, and just dropped them off there. And then when we came away and everybody was trying, you know, to help the refugees, mm -hmm. then we became really aware of what's going on. Because we always considered that the German Jews more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when we really came aware what can happen. But still, we had illusions that it's not going to happen, that the war is not going to break out, that the world is not going to let it do it. Mm -hmm. And then in 1939, on September the 1st, it all started. So tell me, tell me how things I, changed. I'll, it changed dramatically, drastically, and overnight. When the war broke out, the Germans were supposed to come from the west because we were east of Warsaw. But little did we know that they could come from Prussia, from north. And they, they came to us before they even they came to Warsaw. And when they came in, First of all, they bombarded our city. 90% of the city was burned out. People became instant refugees. They lost everything. Luckily, our house wasn't burned and the mill wasn't burned. But I can still see myself laying on that field and seeing the, the city going up in flames. And, and, and the Polish people tried to put an opposition to the Germans. And the Germans came in with, such, with tanks and with such a gusto that they killed a thousand, over a thousand from the civilian population. Now, that was not exclusive of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. It was all kinds uh, of people. All kinds of people. And uh, as they came in, they ran us all out from the house and they put us all in the church. And when we were all in the church, they said that the Gentiles can go home, but the Jews have to stay there. And we thought that they could put, they could burn us all alive. But then it came an order that for the women and children to go home and the men to stay there in the church. Now, what made you think they were going to burn you alive in the church? Because the, the whole city was burning. Okay. And when we went home, I still can see myself going with my mother and my sister home over dead bodies, over dead horses, and, and make it all kind, and shooting just in the air. And then, as, like a miracle, two days later, they let the men out. And your father had been in there, oh, and yeah. your brother. Oh, yeah. And they came home. And they came home two days later. And what happened to the business and the family? Okay. Now, the business, they allowed us to keep the business at the beginning. But little by little, they put all kinds of restrictions. Every day were new orders. Then came out the order that we had to wear stars of David. Mm -hmm. But we didn't wear the yellow stars. like. But we wore bands, armbands, mm -hmm. and the star of David on it. Everybody from age 12 up then in 1940, in the end of 19, almost at the end of 1940, they came in and they took away our business, our livelihood. If, if you could back up just a little bit, when they imposed restrictions on the company, on the flour mill, what kind of restrictions? Not on the flour mill, on but everybody. On everybody. But on, on your family mm. business, what did they say you could do and you couldn't do? What kind of restrictions? If you went down in, this, in, in the street, they could grab you in for work for the dirtiest work, or beat you up. I had my father's father, my grandmother died right after the war broke out in Warsaw, my, my father's family. I remember one time I went to Warsaw. The only time I went was in the, in the end of 
1939, the beginning of 1940. My grandfather was a very religious Jew, and he always wore a beard, never shaved his face in his life. A German soldier came over to him and cut off half of his beard with scissors. And when I saw my grandfather, he cried like a baby. He said, you see me? I'm an old man now. And I never shaved my, my life. So in, he was so ashamed that he put a bandana over his face. That's what I mean, restriction. It didn't only, not us personally, but on everybody. On everybody. On everybody. It was not on us personally. It was on everybody. And then they, for instance, we could, they could come in and take away from us if we had grains in the, in the mill or something. They just came in and took it away without any compensation. And, and finally, and finally, we knew it's going to be coming because they started little by little to take away the bigger enterprises. Mm -hmm. Jews were not allowed to have anything. And we had so many refugees in, in Kalashin. And on top of this, they sent in from the western part of Poland, from two cities, they sent in some more people. And to tell you literally, in some rooms, three families were living together. And then they took away, when they took away our business, I can still see my father when on the, on the, on the, in the yard, and they said, came in and took away the keys. They just they, showed up. And they showed up, and they put in a German trustee to run the mill, because they needed the mill for their own purposes. Mm -hmm. And on top of this, we, had, we lived on the premises of the mill. And they said that we had to evacuate the house. And like I said, we were in a little bit in a better position. So we tried to bribe whoever we could, at least let us stay in the house. So they made us put up so much money and made a fence to separate the mill from the house. And I, to, to, to give you a little illustration how bad it was, that I had to sleep with my grandmother, and I remember her every night. She said, please, God, don't take away my bed. And your grandmother, I mean, this was a very prosperous family. Really, that was a very pro that prominent. But she was that scared. That scared. Please don't take away my bed, because we saw so many refugees. With no place. No place to go. And, 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 and on, on top of this, there was an epidemic of typhus fever. And typhus fever spreads like fire. And people living one on top of the other. I myself was sick with typhus fever. But like I said, I was lucky that they could put me in a hospital. And I was 17 years old, and they cut off my hair, because otherwise they would fall out anyway. And luckily, I sur survived that, that uh, epidemic. And, uh, and I was a healthy girl later on. Now, tell me about that. As, as a Jewish person, was it difficult to get medical care toward the Very end? Very difficult. First of all, we couldn't get any medicines because we used, we, the pharmacy, we had one pharmacy in Kalashi. They put out the Jews. They you had one pharmacy for everybody. So okay. the, the Jews were not allowed to go inside the pharmacy. What they did, they made a little window at the door. And if the pharmacist wanted to come to serve the Jews, it was on his discretion. And, and did the pharmacist choose to do that? or Sometimes he, it, it, there was a lot of people in the pharmacy. He never came to the door. And medicine was very difficult to get. And, and their priority was for the German army. They were the priority. They took all the medicines. They were, they were, uh, what is it? We could get shots against typhus fever, but they didn't give it to us. Mm -hmm. That was everything for the German army. 
And the Germans were marching every day through the city. So now it's 1940. 1940, when they took away our business, they took away our livelihood. And the food, let me put it this way. I didn't go hungry, but it was very, like bread and a little cheese. Meat was very scarce, very scarce. I don't remember, you know, it could go pass by months that we get a piece of meat. And also, you had to share. That's what was so, which sometimes I feel very proud of. Little that we, everybody had, we shared with the people who didn't have it. Mm -hmm. And how did you get food? Did you have to line up somewhere yeah. or? First of all, we got ration cards. I see. Okay. But it was not enough to, to live and not enough to die. Mm -hmm. So everybody tried, oh, I had a, uh, somebody who knew a farmer, who knew somebody. So that's, that's how we tried to get a little bit more than was allowed to us. In those days, 39 and 40, did you get any assistance from the Gentile population at all? An assistant? If we could buy something, that was already assistant. Okay. So some if people wouldn't even sell to you. No, but if, but for money you could have get, you got something. I would say that assistance in a way that that they would sell it to us. Okay. okay now, at the end of the, then forty one. Like I said, that the epidemic of typhus, people were dying right and left. I don't remember much about 41. I just remember that my grandfather and Warsaw died in the ghetto. And then when they put the ghetto in Warsaw, I remember my father was very, very sad because he said, oh no, my whole family is there. And even we didn't have much, we tried to send them some. Because we were also in a ghetto, but we didn't have any fences around us. How but was your family living at that point with no company, no business anymore? You just lived whatever we had saved up. I see. Whatever we had. So saved you had up. access to your money. Money was not money in a bank. Money was in 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 gold or I see. so. It was had, not money. In so the if you had jewelry or, or silver, right, you would or sell. Fur or that. I see. Then when, when the Russians, when the Germans declared war on the Russians, they marched, they probably marched, a half an army marched through Kalashin. They made us give up all the fur, even if you had a little fur collar, because they needed for, the, for, for their soldiers on the Russian front. So everybody had to take out the furs from, from coats, whatever it was, or take off the collars from the coats and give it to the, to bring it to a point. My mother had a, that was so tragic. It, it was not as tragic as before, but it was really sad. And when, when my parents got married, my grandfather gave her Persian lamb coat. Mm -hmm. And she treasured it because, very much. And she said, I'm not going to give it to them. So she took her Persian lamb coat and put it in the oven and burned it. But everybody, we were not allowed to have any fur, little, even even a piece of fur on a coat. Mm. And was I? I honestly, ninety forty one is we lived to survive from day to day, to from day to day, and without that hope was probably running out on us. So isolated. Were there rumors about what was going to happen? W what it did you all it, what, what, what We had, the rumors started in 42. We knew that they were shooting people. They were taking hostages. For instance, if some, for some reason a, a German soldier got killed, 
they used to take 50, 60 people and kill, especially in Warsaw, the Jews. Even if the Jews weren't guilty in it, they used to take hostages, Jews, and kill them without any, any, a, I'm not going to say a judge and jury, mm -hmm. but without any explanation. And in 42, we heard rumors that there's Auschwitz. So, and I can still remember a friend of my father's came and he said, did you hear? They put people in the gas chambers and they burning them. We said, oh no, this can't be happening. How does the world go allowed to do this, something like this? Then at 40, in, 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 in July 42, we, we heard that they started taking out little by little the Jews from Warsaw Ghetto to Treblinka. And so it so happened that Treblinka was not too far from Kalashin. It was about 60 miles. And the trains were going day and night, day and night. And did people know? Oh, yes, they did know it. They knew it that in Treblinka, that is finished. The end. The end of it. And we tried, I, I still remember, we tried to call on the telephone our uncle, my father's brother in Warsaw, and they, we couldn't get an answer. And my father's family all perished. And how many people was that? Roughly about 25 people. I'm just saying cousins and uncles mm -hmm. and aunts. And then, and then we lost all count. That was in July of 42. Now, let that, me back you up just a little bit. Yeah. During this period, how were you personally surviving? I mean, was this when you had your false identity? No, or I, this no, was I still don't. That was all before. Okay. I, the false identity didn't start till in September 9th, in, in, um, in, in November 1942. Okay. Anyway, they started, we used to say that they'd taken out cities. What they did is they used to surround the city so nobody could get out mm -hmm. and take all the Jews on a, pl in a place like a marketplace or something, and then right to the trains and 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 and, and on to Treblinka, mostly to Treblinka. And they worked with such a system that, for instance, they used to take out one city, which was a neighboring city, from one side to the next side, and leave the other city intact. So the people who were hiding, be it in a barn, be it in a field or something, the Jews, will come to that city, and then they used to take out. And that's what happened to Kalashi. And when finally we knew, we knew it's going to happen any day, I didn't intend to go into a labor camp, but I had a friend from Lodge, and she was living in Kalashi at that time, and she, and I was in her house two days before, and she said, you know, my father has a permission for me to go to a labor camp. We had to have a permission to go to a labor camp. And we were renting a horse and buggy, and would you like to go? I said, how many people go? And she said, a couple of people. What did you think the labor camp was about? I, I know the labor, digging ditches, living in, in the barracks. But, but was it, it was a salvation. It was supposed to be safe? Safe. Okay. Okay. When I came up to, my, to the house and I said to my, I asked my father, should I go? He said, you know, I don't know what to tell you. But my mother said, go. And I remember she put on a, she gave me a bag and a pillowcase, and she said, wherever you could be, you can put a little straw in the pillowcase and to sleep in, and a blanket, and a bread, and, and, and some money. I had sewn in money, gold pieces in my dress, and, uh, and some apples, I remember. And she said, put on one, I had a, a light coat and a heavy coat. She said, put on the heavy coat over the light coat, so you can cover yourself with the heavy coat and put on the ski shoes so they go last you longer. 
Now, I, I tried, I'll back up a little bit about a couple of weeks before. We had some people living. A Paul came from a neighboring city, Minsk, near Warsaw. And my sister had that idea. She said, whenever it's going to happen something, I might go on false papers. We knew already about false papers, or false identity papers. And she and, and, and my father talked to that Paul. He said, you know what? I have a brother in Warsaw. Maybe I should I'll take her there. And he's supposed to come for her. But meanwhile, that was a day after I went to the camp. Now I'll go to tell you what the, what the camp was. When I went to that place where I supposed to go on the horse and buggy and go to the camp. It was about five miles from our city. I, he, that man who was supposed to take us there, a Jewish man, a Jewish boy we might knew very well, he looked over the, that permission to go, and he said, my name is not there. I said, you know, I am not going back. So I knew, I, I saw a space between two names. I said, write in my name. And as I was talking, I saw my father coming. And that was the outskirts of the city. It was my sister. And my sister said, you know, Mr. Wojniak is going to come for me tomorrow. And my father said, I came to tell you goodbye, and we're not going to see each other anymore. I, and I don't remember what he said more, but I remember I can still see his face. His, not the face but his back walking away from me. Gave me a kiss and walked away. That Mr. Wojciech, unfortunately, didn't come on time, and my sister had to run away. And she ran to a neighboring labor camp. I didn't know it. But then, after the following Sunday, for some reason, the Germans allowed us to walk from one camp to the other, and my sister came. And she told me that she couldn't, that he didn't come for her. But she had the idea, she said, I'll do any, whatever is my power, and I'm going to run away, because we were not on the fences. And anyway, the Jews didn't want it to run. As a matter of fact, they tried to get into the camp. And she said, and I'm going. And she did. She knew where he lived. And she went to his house, and he took her to Warsaw. A couple days later, he came for me. He was, he, he was not afraid of anything. He came to the camp. But unfortunately, he came on Sunday when we didn't work. And I couldn't just walk away from there because everybody was, was uh, walking around and, 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 the, and the German guards. So I said, I can't go. He said, maybe it's going to be too late. I said, I can't go because they go shoot me, they go shoot you, and they may torture you, and, and they might ask you uh, who sent you for me. Finally, two days later, he came back, but on a work day. And, and I said, I'm going with you. And I said, there were some friends of mine, three friends and a cousin, and went out behind the barrack on a night. It was raining and cold in November. And I went to his house. He took me to the train station, from the train station to his house. Now, this man was a Polish man. A he was Polish a Catholic. Man. He was more left. Uh, he was a Catholic, born Catholic, but he not but a practicing. He, but he son. certainly wasn't Jewish. No, no. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. And he took me to his house to stay overnight in his house. And I remember I had a real hot meal in his house that night. It was the first hot meal you'd had in a long time. And the following day, he took me, and I was reunited with my sister. Now, my parents had some gold pieces in, hidden near the house on the premises of the mill. And we knew we have to get it out. We knew where they were. And we told him about it, and we said, you have, for some reason, you got to go and get it out. He said, I'll go. 
What's he for him? He does no problem. I'll go. We knew exactly. We said it's going to take you two minutes, but go at night. He said, and, and he said, okay, I'll go. The following day, he was so nice that he, when he got it out, he didn't want it to stop in his house because he didn't want it to tell his wife in case he told us that she's going to be so greedy and she would want some, or she would say that he didn't find it. Mm -hmm. So he came straight to Warsaw. And I asked him, how did you get into there? He said, you know what? They went for lunch. And when I saw them going out all for lunch, I jumped through the fence. And in two minutes, I headed out, and he brought us back. And it's such a paradox that my parents saved all that money during the First World War for the children, for education, for, for, for marrying them off. Little did they know that that money is going to help us. I'm not going to say it's safe because we were lucky, but it was a tremendous help. We could pay off, we could make. At that time, I had to make, in order for me to, to be on the Polish side, I had to have a Polish identification card. So that's when you decided. That, that's, my, that's when I had to have this identification card, mm -hmm. which I, the picture's mine, the handwriting is mine, the fingerprints are mine, but the name is not mine. And it's not my religion. But tell me about the nickname, how you picked the name Apollonia. Because my name was Pola, and in shortened Apollonia is called Pola in Poland. So I said, at least let me keep one name. And if it would be easier, we were not confused. It was, in the beginning, it was plenty, plenty confusion, because I was afraid if I could blabber out my mind, whatever can happen, and I could say my real name. But this one, when the Germans made gave the order that every Pole had to have identification card. It was in German and in Polish. The Jews were not allowed. That's how they knew who was Jewish. Who was Jewish. And it was very difficult. I don't remember how much, but I know it cost us a lot of money to have made that card. How did you know who to ask? There was an a administrator of a house. See, it usually went through administrators of a house. Mm -hmm. And we developed a little network, like an underground network. People who can trust, people who can be bribed, who people who wouldn't be bribed, who just we couldn't trust, and people who did it just from the good heart of it. And so that's how, is that one way you met some of the Polish yeah, Catholics? Did, yeah. And then when we, and even being in Warsaw, we didn't, when Mr. Wojniak took a, in his brother's house, it was just like, when they, some other people find out, it just was one room, like a train station. The Jewish people had a hiding place there. Sometimes used to sleep on the floor, five, six people. And he didn't take any money. He, but it was, we used to call it, it used to get hot. What we meant hot, that somebody's on our, footsteps. So we had to go from place to place, from place to place. And when the, and that was about six months. The final place we lived was a widow who her husband was in the Polish army. And at that time, the, the uprising in Warsaw Ghetto broke out. And we were not too far from it. Warsaw Ghetto. We saw, we heard the fights and the and the shootings and the fires and everything. And we decided, we said, we got to get away from there. So we discussed it with that lady. I said, where can we go? She said, you know what? I had one time a girl living with me who was from Częstochowa. I know her name, but I don't know her address. But I, and I know she's married now. And her husband's father made coaches for the horse and buggies. Mm -hmm. So he said, let's go there. And, and we had a good excuse because Chancellor Hoover was 
They had a shrine there, and uh, people used to go on pilgrimages there. Even during the war? Less during the war, more before the war. Mm -hmm. But everybody knew that you go into Chenstrava, you go into the Black Madonna, see I Black see. Madonna. So, so we ask her, we're going to pay you. Come with us. She said, OK, I'll go with you. So the first thing we did, we came to Częstochowa. So she had, she, we had to find out who, who that lady is, but it was not so easy to find out, because she didn't have a name. She didn't have the married name. So we went to a restaurant and had a lunch. When we had lunch, she, we had to ask the waiter, do you know, we came from to, 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 as pilgrims, do you know where we can stay overnight? He said, yes, there's uh, two nuns, private nuns, not in our order, who have a, a, a boarding house. So I'll take you there. And sure enough, he took us there. She stayed with us for a couple of days. But somehow, for some reason, that one nun, there were two nuns, she recognized us that we are Jewish. And one day she called us, she said, tell me the truth, you are Jewish. You see that boy who lives here? He's Jewish too. Somebody put him there. If you go tell me the truth, I'll try to, for you to get you somebody who will give you employment. And if you go get employment, maybe you'll be able to live here. Little did I know that she was trying to exploit us in a way that she found out that we had some money, gold pieces, and she took it away from us. But to go back a couple of days, I said, what we could do? She said, that man has a glass factory, and he's supposed to come here this evening. And he came, and he looked us over, he said, you come tomorrow to my factory. We didn't know that she told them that we are Jewish girls. And we went, we learned what to do. As a matter of fact, we were top-notch workers with him. But I still, we always used to, when we used to have a free time, my sister and I, and we were able to discuss something. We, we said, does he know or doesn't he know? Mm -hmm. Does he know or doesn't he know? But one time he said something to me. He said, now you're under my wings. And as we walked home from work, I said, Hannah, he knows. And then he came out. He said he knows. And he said, so I asked him, what motivates you to do it? He said, you see, I have two daughters. And if they would be in any trouble, I would like them, somebody, to give them a helping hand. And, and, and the run money, our money, would start running out. So at least we had employment and we earned some money. And then we established ourselves. We made friends in the factory. We went together to church. We went Sunday out together. And that made us more part of the community. Now, this started in early 1943? In 43. In May 43, we came to Częstochowa. And you stayed there? Till the liberation. Well, t tell, me about, tell me about the liberation. Now, I wanted to, to back off a little before okay. the liberation. One more thing that I wanted okay. to tell you. We had to go away from those nuns. And then, when we talked to our boss about it, he said that I have my priest, he was a very devout Catholic, my boss. He said, I would like you to talk to him. And the nun said, I think somebody's suspecting you in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, on that block. And, and I don't know if I'll be able to give you. That's when we start talking with our boss. Maybe we could find another place. And he told me, I said, you know what? You go and talk to that priest, but I want you to tell him the truth. So I went and talked to him. I said, we don't need any financial help. We need moral help. 
we need to save our lives. He said, okay, I'll go and I'll see what I can do. He went to some, also to nuns, because there were so many nuns in Chenstakhov, to another order. And she, at first, she accepted us. But when we, the following day, when she, we came back from work, she said, I don't want you to even to stay here overnight. We said, it's almost curfew, 8 o'clock. After 8 o'clock, you couldn't stay on the street. They go shoot us. She said, you know what? He is a, not too far, a boarding house, also operated by nuns. Go there. And she gave us the address. And we, walk, and we came just in time before the curfew. And when we knocked on the door, they asked, they asked us what we want. And I said, we wanted to sleep overnight. And in the morning, we went to work. And we told our boss what happened. And as we were talk, as I was going through the hallway, I saw that a picture of that priest. And I said to, the bo to our boss, to Mr. Rilski, I said, you know what? I saw a picture of that priest. He said, talk to the nun. And I went back to talk to that priest, and he told me, I think this one will take you in. And we came back from work, and I met the Mother Superior in the hallway, and she had such an angelic face. And I said, Mother Superior, we wanted to talk to you, but confidentially. She was shocked. She said, what do the girls want to talk to me confidentially? I said, let's go in, in the office. And there was a girl ironing something in the office. She told the girl to get out, and, and, and we said, Mother Superior, we are Jewish girls. We need your help. We want you to take us in. She asked very few questions. But we said, please take us under your wings, because we feel like we could be safe here. She said, what are you doing? We said, we are working. We are earning money. We told her how much. We said, we could give you all the money, what we earn. She said, no, you're not going to give it to me all. you got to give some for yourself, too. And that's when we stayed till the liberation day. Now, the liberation came to us. We knew that, this, that, the, that the Germans had one defeat after the other, because we used to buy the every day the paper. Even it was under censorship from the German army, we could figure out between the lines that, that they uh, were, were defeated on each front. On the day of the liberation, we didn't know it's going to happen so quick. We went to the factory, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the day, the lights went out, and everything stopped. The boss went home for lunch. He couldn't come back. And then we heard shootings. And, and tanks coming in. And here we are stuck in the factory, and the shootings were going on. So another girl and my sister and myself, we said, we have, for some reason, we have to okay. get back to the house. And we went through, oh, to dead people and to dead horses, and, and through Russians and through Germans, and finally we reached the house, through broken glass, through broken... We reached the house where the nuns were, and I, when we came in, the mother superior saw us, and she said, like Jack, any mother, she said, come on the kitchen, let's get something to eat. And after we came back, we sat down on the bed, and the first time we had a really big cry. And I guess the people around us, they didn't realize why we crying. But that is the first time the realization came to us, what now? Could you, could you tell me when you found out what happened to your parents? When I was in labor camp, a Paul came and he said that 18 people were taken out from the building near the mill. And I knew they were hiding there, because we prepared them for hiding there. And he said they took him all out on the cemetery and shot them. And then I had a confirmation a couple of years ago. Our janitor's son, who became a doctor, 
who was in the United States, and he came to visit me in Charleston, and he told me how exactly. I, I, I'm more relaxed now than I was when he told me that story. He said, I looked to binoculars, how they took, when they till they disappeared on the cemetery. And this was your mother and your father and your brother? My brother, my brother wasn't the part, my, my brother wasn't there. My brother was on the way to Treblinka. He jumped from the train and he was in the woods with the partisans. And he had a girlfriend there. And he, he was, he, they shot him, they found him about four months before they liberated that place. The, our hope was always, we were talking, and we going back, we knew that he was somewhere hiding in the part, with the partisans. And we said, oh, our brothers probably could survive. Because geographically, we knew how geographically when the rush that, that Kalushin was liberated in July 44, mm -hmm. because it was east of Warsaw, the Russians came there first. And we were, where well, Częstochowa was south of Warsaw. So they came a couple months later. And we hooked up with a family who was liberated also in hiding, not in, in, in the, in, in they came to Kalushin in July 1944. And when we came back, and, and one little story I wanted to tell you but, but about the liberation, mm -hmm. too. We got a letter. I'm going to make it short now. We got a letter. One person knew where we were. And that person was liberated before we did, before, before we were. And he wrote to us. He said, I'm in Kalashin. And he told us that there is a family Berman. But we couldn't get it. He sent it registered letter. The factory wasn't working. Nobody was working. But we tried to, to come to the factory to see maybe they could start working. So the secretary told us there was the mailman with, with, with a letter, a registered letter to you, and he didn't want to leave it on my assumed name. So we said, what time was he? And she said, she said oh, I, I don't remember, but that's a certain time. So we said, we could be there here at that time. Maybe he, he'll come back the following day. And when we went back the following day, he said he was already here. And he still didn't want to leave it. So I said to my sister, you know what? I'm going to the post office. And the following day, and whoever, each mailman who will come out from the post office with the letters, I'm going to stop him and ask him if he got a letter from me. And sure enough, I said, I didn't open the letter, but I just turned the envelope of what there used to be where from. They used to put it on the back of the envelope. Mm -hmm. I turned the envelope, and when I saw Berman's in Kalushin, I jumped and I ran. As you took 45 minutes, used to come to take from the post office to the house. I must be running 15 minutes to my sister. And when we opened the letter. We, right away, we made arrangements to go back. The following day, we made arrangements to go back. And it, it chance to have, we could make it by normal circumstances. It should have taken us about three hours trip. It took us three days. We traveled by horse and buggy, by train, with wounded Russian soldiers, by foot. And when you got back there, what did you find? That family who was there, who was liberated, and we hooked up with them. We Gosh. stayed. All the remnants, really remnants, hooked up together under one roof and one bed and one kitchen. And we couldn't stay long, long in Kalashin because for some reason they came, some Paul came and killed two Jews. So we just packed, didn't have much to pack up. We didn't have any many possessions, and we went to Warsaw, and then from Warsaw to Lodz, and from Lodz to Germany, and then here, and then here. If you could, if you have one one last thing you'd like to say, that you think is important or s sums up the essence of your experience. What 
The most important thing I have to say, not to judge the people what religion they belong to, what nationality they belong to. Judge them by their deeds. Don't single out. Because they were different, they have a different accent. I know I never go lose my accent, and maybe I'm not so proficient in English. But please let them judge by their deeds and not where they came from and not generalize. That's the most important. Not generalize. Because he looks different, he must be bad. He's, so that, that is, and, and I told that to my children. I was lucky here. We established a family, and, and uh, the children are very pro successful here. And uh, that is, I think, my biggest achievement here. Thank you so much. Thank you, too. Thank you.